hardware detected. Oh no, not right now. Okay. Okay. I am good now. Okay. Great. So that was my first moment. So he can troubleshoot. Um, I think I need this until after the presentation. I, I need this until okay. after the presentation. So yeah. All right. Yes, we're good. And is it okay if I um just start with the announcement and everything? Okay. Hey. Okay. Hey everyone, thanks so much and sorry about this. Okay, I promise because I'm teaching class in the next two weeks and we're two minutes late and I hate starting late. So I promise next time all this will be fixed. <laughs> so we'll be starting right at 1030. Um, my name is Myra Cite. I'm president of GCA Georgia Chapter. And I believe we've got a few folks online, and today we're going to be talking about why you should get your business certified. So um, I usually make things very interactive. Please interrupt me if you have questions, and I try to make it fun because, you know, it's not always the most interesting topic. So, um, you know, it may as well be fun in the process. So let's get started. Okay, and Andrew, you're still able to hear me? You are self-muted. If you can be my eyes and ears online. Andrew? He probably stepped away from the front. But anyway, I think we're good. Okay, so let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about why you get your business certified and what the, what the benefits of certification are for your business. So, um, and uh, I've got way too many things plugged in here. Ah, ah. Okay, there we go. So what are certifications? Basically, certifications can be a number of things. They can be from the SBA, if you are a veteran. Um, it can be from the Veterans Administration. It can be state certifications. It can be local or municipal certifications. Um, a number of things. So when I talk about certifications, I'm not talking about your um, ISO 9001 or anything like that. I'm talking about certifications as it pertains to your designation as a small women minority veteran owned hub zone business. Um, so those are what we're referring to when we talk about certifications here in this context. So what, and okay, good. <laughs> so basically what certifications are, they're designations for your business that reflect a particular status to whomever it is, whether it's the government, uh, the state, the municipality, corporations, even corporations use certifications because many Corporations, especially the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 companies, have supplier diversity programs. So they oftentimes will want to do business with women or veterans or minority owned corporations. So um, certifications designate that particular status to your business. It's not good enough that you are a minority owned business or that you are, in fact, a woman owned business. That's great, but certification proves that. And basically, what that third party agency or the government entity is trying to do is prove it based on the ownership of the company and the control of the business as far as who is running the day-to-day -day operations, who's making the decisions based on the paperwork, how the ownership is structured and all that good stuff. Okay. And um, like I said, certifications are issued by different entities. So it can be third party agencies. Examples of that would be um, here in Georgia, we have the uh, Georgia Minority Supplier Development Council. Um, we have Greater Women's Business Council. We also have um, NW, National Women's Business Owners Corporation, NWBOC. They have a Georgia presence as well. So those are all examples of third party certifiers. The one key difference between a third party certifier and all of the others is that third party certifier is paid a fee. And can you still hear me? You see what? Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. But but you can still see the slides, right? Okay, okay. I know, I figure we'll tackle one piece at a time. <laughs> so, um, Laura's like, okay, so the difference third party organizations or third party um, certifying agencies are going to be paid a fee. And that their fee is to cover their operating costs. You are basically the certified business for those companies, 
and the members of those third party agencies are the 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 coca colas of the world and the ibms and the ups's and the northrop grumman's and all of the big fortune 500 fortune thousand companies that are their members so it behooves you to pay that fee because you're basically paying for access to those companies that have those supplier diversity programs and want to use you as a woman minority or veteran owned small business for um for their their basically supply chain needs does that make sense Okay. Yeah, I mean, you not to say you can't, but if when it comes to like a Coca Cola, if you want to be a supplier through their diversity program, you basically have to have that certification, yes. But you can be a supplier and just not be considered a minority supplier. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You are required to pay a fee if you choose to use one of those third party organizations for, let's say, your MBE certification. If you go to GMSDC, you have to pay GMSDC their $350, $500 every year to remain a member there. Okay. Oh, that, it depends on, well, GMSDC is not contingent on business size. So there could be something that you paid extra because they have different layers of service that they're offering now. So if you did pay a higher fee like that, then you've got some of their premium services, but just the flat certification. And I can't remember, it depends on which certifying agency. Every state has one. Um, and sometimes, um, more than one state will be in one one area so like gmsdc has i think 32 regional offices around the country so of course there's not one per state but um so several states will be combined in one um and depending on the state will depend on your fee generally a minority certification is between 350 and 500 dollars and that's a flat fee every year Women Business Enterprise National Council, um, that's, I love them because they literally have a standardized process that no matter which of their regional offices, which of their 30, 37 offices you use, all the fees are the same, all the processes are the same, nothing changes, and they publish their standards. Unlike the Minority Development Council, which does not, and the rules change every time I go to a different place. <laughs> I guess I'm in a unique position because I do certifications for so many different people that I see the varying rules and most folks you're certifying your business in your state. So you don't know that the rules may be different elsewhere. But all that to say for the Women Business Enterprise National Council, those fees are tiered based on your revenues. So if your revenues are less than a million, you're going to pay 350. If your revenues are 10 million or above, you're going to pay $1,000, but that's the most you're going to pay. And there's a, a, a stair step process and it'll tell you exactly based on your revenues, what the fee is, and they look at your tax returns to determine that. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time along the way. Um, states, municipalities, and government agencies like SBA, VA, all of those, they're, they're as many of those certifications as there are different states and municipalities and all that, and they're like 53,000 different municipalities in the US. So I would not advise you go out and get certified everywhere before you start doing business because you'll never get any business done unless you are, you know, independently wealthy and really don't want to go to work because <laughs> there's no reason to, to do them all, right? But all of those, the states, the municipalities, or the government certifications are not going to have a fee. You will never pay the SBA something to get certified. You're never going to pay the VA something to get certified. Now, you may pay someone like me or a, a consultant to do it for you, but just keep in mind that there is no fee that you're paying to SBA for your HUBZone certification or to VA for your, your, um, your better known or, dis, um, or service disabled better known small business. You're never gonna pay a fee to City of Atlanta for your certification, okay? So those municipal type certifications are never gonna have a fee. If you are looking at the DOT, Department of Transportation Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, again, there's no fee that you're gonna pay 
directly to the state of Georgia or state of Virginia or whatever state you happen to be registered in to do that. Okay. What did I? This sensitive thing. I must have hit something. Okay. So here we are. So let's talk about what certifications are not. They are not entitlement programs. Okay. So there is no benefit by just being certified. You know. You can get every, like I said, go out there because you're independently wealthy and get every certification known to man that is not going to get you any more contracts because it's just like a degree. If you don't market yourself, if you don't go out and apply for jobs and send in your resume and do all the work, you're never going to get work. So it is just literally that a piece of paper that proves that you, in fact, are the owner of your business and you own and control your business and you have whatever that designation is. Um, so there's no benefit just by being certified and also yes the government does have goals that they are are suggested to meet um, where five percent of all contracting dollars are to go to women-owned small businesses and generally 20 percent of all contracting dollars are supposed to go to small businesses but it's not um it there's never going to be a case where because you're a small or disadvantaged business that you basically have it better than someone who doesn't have that disadvantage um, because the vast majority of contracting dollars always do and will always go to large businesses, even though they make up a smaller percentage. And that's just the nature of the work, the nature of the fact that DOD is the one that awards the lion's share of contracts, generally approximately 70% of all contracting dollars are DOD. Some of those really big projects are proprietary. So you can't know those secrets, only Lockheed Martin can. So that's just the nature of the work that the large companies will always get the bigger share. So don't, don't ever let anyone say, oh, that's just an entitlement program because that's not right. Um, certifications are not gonna be your primary selling point either, okay? You know, and, and contracting officers have been up here preaching this exact same message. So it's not us saying it, it's them saying it on, on it's us saying it on their behalf. Because depending on who it is, sometimes they are bold enough to say it to your face. Other times they aren't. They just say it's like fingernails down a chalkboard. Don't walk into the business. Oh, I'm a woman-owned business. You need to give me a contract. I'm a minority-owned business. You need to give me a contract. They're like, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> you need to get out of my office. <laughs> you need to sell your services. What do you do better than anyone? That's your primary selling point. The, oh, by the way, is I happen to be an 8A, a hub zone, a woman-owned, a veteran-owned, or whatever your designation is. That's just the, uh, who, who's from Louisiana here? Nobody? Oh, oh, are you really? Okay, so that's just the lanyard. Am I saying that right? Okay, so that's just the cherry on top, right? That, that's just the, 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 the addition, the icing on the cake. That's not your primary selling feature. Okay, so don't, don't ever do that to a contracting officer because whether, you know, depending on their poker face, they'll either roll their eyes in front of you or they'll just, you know, as soon as you leave, toss, you, toss your resume or your, your cake statement into the trash. Okay? Um, certifications are also, they are not one size fits all. So two businesses may be sitting right next to each other. Both of you may be woman owned, but your certifications may be very different. Yes, maybe both of you have a woman owned small business, but one of you may be a veteran and one's a minority. And so depending on your business and more importantly, depending on who your clients are, are going to dictate what certifications you should do. Because not every certification is going to speak to the same audience. Okay. Um, we talked a lot about corporate clients. Corporations have one language and the government speaks a different one. So if you're getting um, a certification through, let's say GMSDC, Georgia Minority Supplier Development Council, as a minority owned business, um, Coca-Cola, IBM, they understand that certification. Um, but if you got an 8A certification, which is also a certification that's primarily for minority owned businesses, and you went to Coca-Cola or IBM with that, they would probably look at you like you had two or three heads. And the only time that would be different is if you're talking to maybe a Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman, where the majority of their work as the corporation is in the federal space. 
So because they do a lot of federal work, they understand that federal certification, but it still may or may not work for their internal supplier diversity program. So just keep in mind that certifications fall into several buckets. So I like to tell people that it's your corporate bucket for your, you know, your Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 corporations, your city, state, municipal bucket for your, your local municipalities, and then the federal bucket. Okay, so federal agencies, they understand hub zone. They understand better known small business. Basically, any certification that's issued by the SBA or by the VA is one they understand, right? Because they wrote the rules and they speak that language. Your city, states, municipalities, generally, they want to see the certification that belongs to them. If you're doing business with the city of Atlanta, trying to win Super Bowl work, they want to see that you have a city of Atlanta certification. Now, of course, they may, there may be exceptions, Super Bowl being one of them, where they have opened it up to any certification from GMSTC or Greater Women's Business Council or from a DOT, DBE certification. Those kinds of certifications will also work trying to do Super Bowl work, but they will let you know what the rules of the game are. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Okay, I think I'm, I'm going on that in the other slide. <clears throat> and the most important thing that certifications are not is they're not manna from heaven, okay? You are not going to get certified. The heavens will not open up. And ah! <laughs> contracts rain down from the heavens. It's not the way it works, folks. Okay, <laughs> certifications, yes, depending on which one you're doing, sometimes they're hard work to get, but that's where the hard work begins because then you have to go marketing to different agencies and, and all that kind of stuff and make sure they understand who you are and what you do and why you do it better than anyone. And it's going to be one of those long daunting processes of getting knocked down over and over and over again. And just being, um, I used to call it in corporate pleasantly persistent. And um, I, I, <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this, especially because it's recorded, but I have something that I, I, I should have named it differently. But I turned when I was working in corporate as a drop dead letter. So, you know, I'd, I'd contact somebody, they'd come in the office or do whatever, and we'd talk about whatever it was we were doing. And then I would just, you know, kind of put them on a calendar. So every couple of days I was touching them and reaching out. And if they just cons consistently never responded to my phone calls or emails, I would send this drop dead email. <laughs> like, and it was very, very nice. But so I don't know why I called it drop dead, but it always, like 100% of the time, it got a response back, okay? It was, like, it was like, this is Myra just following up again. You know, we talked about last time you were in, whenever it was, because I took the dates, like, in, by that time, it was about three weeks ago. We talked about X, Y, and Z. You know, if you're not interested, I totally understand. I'm a big girl, so I can take a no. Please give me the courtesy of a response. And every time, because nobody wants to be discourteous, right? Like, oh my gosh, I, I'm being rude by not responding to her. But they always call me back. They're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I've been out of business, out of town or busy or whatever. So do that with contracting officers. Be be persistent. And um, who was it? I think it was Gwen Miles with the CDC when they were here last year during October for a big event. She was saying that, you know, it's she already has a job. <laughs> I think that's exactly what she said. She's like, I've got a job. It's your job to follow up with me if you want to do business with me. So it's not their job to chase you down. It's your job to chase them down since you're the one that wants the work. Yes, she's got a job to issue that work to small businesses, but you know, she's got her hands full and already has probably two or three people that can do the work. You need to convince her that, hey, I want a shot too. And you know, by your persistence, one thing that you're showing to them is that, okay, I can count on this person. They are definitely going to be somebody that, if nothing else, they know how to follow up and get a job done, right? So you're showing a bit of your character and how you do things by the way you follow up with these agencies, okay? So, so important. Don't mean to beat it over the head, but. Okay, why get certified? That's what this whole class is about. I usually advise my clients to get certified and go through the process if one of the following is true for their business. If they have a client that asks, are you certified? Are you a woman owned small business? I mean, duh. It's like, if you're not, you're like, you know, I'm not, but I'm working on that right now, or I can get to working on that right now. So if you have a client that asks 
you to certified or request that you get certified, that means that probably means they have a lot more work they can give you if they can check that little box saying that they're giving it to a whatever owned small business. So if you've got a client that's asking you about it, by all means, go for it. Um, if you want uh, preferences when bidding on local contracts, you know how I mentioned earlier that, you know, City of Atlanta, if you're bidding on a project there, they want to see their own certification. I know DeKalb County and many of the others, they have a preferred, um, how do they, what do they call it? Uh, it's not pricing, but, um, you know, they score things based on a point system. <clears throat> so if you have a local small business enterprise, then you get an extra 10 points added to your score. If you are an MSA LSBE, a, a metropolitan statistical area, local small business enterprise, which means, I know, isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> that means you are a small business, but you're not located in DeKalb, you're in one of the, the 26 metro counties, then you can get five extra points at it. Now, if you don't have either of those, you get no extra points. So that can mean the difference, you know, if you're scoring a 70 and the winner is scoring a 77 and you get 10 points, you're now the winning bidder. So that's very important to consider that oftentimes when you're bidding on those local projects, that that local certification can give you a leg up, okay? And also, if you want to compete on set-aside contracts, and that's kind of um, the obvious no-brainer, and we're going to uh, look at some live opportunities in a moment to go through that. And then, of course, if you want the opportunity to win sole source contracts um, in the federal government, sole source contracts are um, awarded to 8A firms, to um, better known small businesses. I've never seen one for women owned. I don't think they have sole source. And I, I understand that there are sole source opportunities for hub zone companies as well. Um, generally, you're not going to see the sole source opportunities published live but we're going to go um, on the next screen to kind of look at some FBO opportunities for set aside. Okay, so what questions do we have so far? Let's see. I think I saw a question running across your face, Reggie. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Because next thing we're going to look at some live opportunities. And while we do that, Andrew, I'm going to need for you to tell me if you're still able to see my screen because I'm going to exit out of the presentation and get online. And I need for you to let me know. Hardware tech. It's not hardware. That is a floppy disk. Let's look at where you can find that if you're in a hub zone. SBA.gov. This is an amazing resource. And Andrew, can you tell me if you can still see my screen? I can still see your screen. Awesome, thanks so much. And we got some other folks joining us online, so welcome. Um, feel free to ask any questions online, um, and I will get to those as, um, as we have time. So whatever questions you have, just type them in. Uh, what am I looking for? Hub Zone. So on the SBA's website, um, this little search box, and just type in Hub Zone, and they have a really cool calculator right here. Oh, what happened? There we go. Okay, and go into the Hub Zone program. And you, where's the set? Yep, find your business on the Hub Zone now. Who wants to give me an address? Business address. Anyone? Somebody. Hmm? The street. No, the, the whole street address. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's in Norcross. That might be. We'll see. Oh, not qualified. Womp, womp. The good thing about this map, though, is you can see it tells you, like, it pinpoints where you are and then tells you where the hub zone is. Um, Georgia doesn't have a whole lot of hub zones, I'm just going to say. But look, on the other side of that Spalding Drive there, um, is that going into Decatur? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, yeah. I was going to say Gwinnett has very, very, very few hub zones, um, unfortunately. And, uh, but that, that is a very good certification because not a whole lot of people <clears throat> have that certification. Um, oh, okay, we've got a couple of people. 
uh, I'm going to look up your Hurt Plaza address. I think, um, Labricia, I think you might be in luck because I believe um, a lot of downtown is in a hub zone. <clears throat> Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Qualified hub zone. You are in a hub zone. Whoop whoop. So, uh oh, I lost the question. So, um, good. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Now, um, there there are a lot of things to consider about hub zone certification. Um, make sure you join us next week because we're going to be talking specifically about the different types of certifications and I'll go into the qualifications that you need to look at um, for that. But keep in mind, um, I might get to some of that today, that not only does your business have to be located in, in a hub zone, but the majority of the employees, well, not the majority, 35% of your workforce also has to be in a hub zone. So if it's just a small business with only you or you and a couple of folks, if you also live in a hub zone, then you're going to be golden. And then Hassan, you have a question here. What is the order of, of engagement? Should I market first and get certified next or the other way around? That's an excellent, excellent question. Okay, so um, Hassan was asking, you know, should he go out and market his business first and then get certified or go get certified first? I always recommend do the marketing first. Do what it takes to start getting money, right? Marketing is going to win you business. You do not have to be certified to win contracts. I'm going to say it again. You do not have to be certified to win contracts. And everyone say it with me. I do not have to be certified to win contracts. Right. Okay. So think about it this way. All of the big businesses out there, they don't qualify for certifications, but they're winning the bulk of the contracts. So this is certification can give you a competitive advantage. Yes. But go out and if you do it the way that you're considering it, Hassan, where you go out and market first, then your certifications are going to have so much more power because the people already know you, they already like you, they already trust you. And now they say, oh my gosh, you have a HubZone certification. I never meet my HubZone goal. Here's this whole other pot of contracts that we're going to give to you. Oh my goodness, you've got a veteran known certification. Here, here's some more work for you. So yes. Uh, Always, always, always market first. Um, now, most of us are here because you're probably looking at certifications for your business. Don't put the certifications necessarily on the back burner. If you've got the time right now and the effort and energy to do the certifications, do both. Do the certifications and market as well. But I always tell people, especially when they start looking at certifications like 8A, that is a very powerful certification. It can help you take your business to the next level. We here at GCA like to call it a millionaire maker, but the fact is HubZone is one and done. It is the, the quintessential definition, if you look it up in the dictionary, of a once in a lifetime opportunity. You can never get HubZone again once you qualify as the what they call disadvantaged individual, and that means you were the one taking your business to get 8A certified. You can never qualify any other business ever again for 8A. You get one shot at it. So you either make it or you don't. And you only have nine years to do it. That's the only certification with a time limit or a clock on it. So you definitely want to market first so you know how to win contracts already before you go into that once in a lifetime, one time only, nine year only opportunity so that you literally hit the ground running. And the best example I have is one of my clients from several years ago. They were um, you know, a small IT firm husband wife team <clears throat> and she was the disadvantaged individual on the on the team and they were winning some really small contracts but doing a lot of work with i think it was northrop grumman at the time doing some work there subcontracting work they got their 8a literally they had two agencies that were okay when is your 8a coming through as we were you know getting to the, towards the end of that process they got their 8a had two 8a contracts ready for them and early last year they won like a tens of millions, like $30 million contract with DOD, but they, they marketed first. They already had built the relationships. They built the subcontracting relationships with Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and all that kind of stuff. So then as they got their 8A and got their feet under them, the flip, just, the script flipped 
where they were the prime and Northrop Grumman was their sub for these projects that Northrop Grumman couldn't win. So yeah, definitely do the marketing first. So excellent question. I'm so glad you asked it. I am going to steal it next time and put it in my presentation like it was mine though. But thank you, son. <laughs> so now let's get into, uh, we're going to look at some live opportunities. So we're going to go to FedBizOps. Oh, poor FedBizOps. Look at this. This is, I've been doing this since 2011. I have never seen FedBizOps with so few opportunities. <laughs> I mean, last week it was down to 21,000 opportunities. Usually they're about 37,000, close to 40,000 opportunities. But, you know, when half the government is shut down, they're kind of tabashing some stuff. I, mean, probably a way. I, I think there's probably a wave coming. And the thing is, I don't know if it's going to be over the next couple of weeks because, you know, we only have, we, they kicked the count on the road three weeks, right? So let's hope we learned our lessons. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to be like two-year-olds, but let's say we've learned our lessons, and if if everything is well after this three weeks is over, then I imagine there's going to be a flood of stuff, because, I mean, basically that means all those agencies, the nine agencies that were affected, are going to get their appropriations, and they only have until September 30th to spend all that money, or then they're going to lose it next year. So, yeah, get what you need to get done, and get ready for the, the flood that's coming so, um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get logged in here. And you can search for opportunities in FBO without logging in, but I'm always going to suggest that you do set up yourself as a vendor and get registered so that you can save your searches, so that you can make it so FBO will email you anytime an opportunity comes up that matches your search, and then that way you're, you're not having to do as much work. Okay. Every time you log in, you have to accept the conditions. The unfortunate part is once you create your profile, you always land on your own FBL, but you just have to go over to opportunities to find some. So we are going to search by set-asides. And let's look for a veteran-owned small business certification. Do we have any vets in the room? We do? All righty. Are you certified? Okay, good. Okay. Oh my gosh, only 47 opportunities. It's crazy. Okay, so we got 47 and we got a new question. I center it. Okay. Oh, good, good. Well, I can certainly help you with that. Okay, so here are the 47 opportunities that are set aside for veteran owned small business. So that means the only way you can bid on this opportunity is if the company bidding is a veteran owned small business. So that's why it's so important to have the different certifications. So you, maybe you found, you know, something that's perfect for what you do, but you know, you're not a veteran owned small business. Furnish and install mini split AC unit. I imagine this is an HVAC kind of opportunity. It's probably at the Department of Veterans Affairs. It, oh, the Department of Army. So, and I don't know if you noticed, but um, the military oh, that happens quite a bit. The military loves doing business with vets. So, uh, if you are a veteran, then um, you definitely want to get your veteran or service disabled veteran on small business certification so that you can uh, take advantage of, of those opportunities. Because, like I said, DOD has the bulk. Of contracting opportunities and let's look at the woman-owned small business set-asides see what may be out there you got 74 WOSB set-asides now the um, <clears throat> one thing I'm going to remind you that you may not know about woman-owned small business and economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business this is not true for all of them but it is for these two when there's a set-aside um, Oh, it's not when there's a set aside. So by the time it's set aside, that means they already know. Okay, let's say there's a pre-solicitation here, or um, I, I'm, I'm all over the place right now. Okay, a source is sought. <laughs> Let me start from the beginning. When there are sources sought out here, um, and there are like 3,050 uh, sources sought that are out there right now. 
Some of these are not set aside for anything. Can you all see that, first of all? I can't blow it up. How do I do that? Okay, but you can see it? Yeah. Okay, so like this one, this Kings Bay dry dock recapitalization. Okay, that's a source of salt, but it's not set aside for anything like this one. It's a source of salt that's for an SDVOSB. If this is something that you do, then what you may want to do, and let's say it's something that's, oh, this one is a good one, the janitorial, because janitorial is one of those um, things that a lot of people do. There are a ton of janitorial firms out there. So if janitorial services is something that you do, and you're like, okay, if this just goes out for bid, there are going to be like hundreds of janitorial firms that bid on it. But I'm a woman in small business, and I know another woman owned small business that's here at GCA that's a janitorial firm too. You collaborate with that person and both of you submit source of salt requests. And both of you ask the contracting officer as you submit the request, would you consider setting this aside for a woman owned small business? But the rule is there have to be two or more qualified women owned small businesses before they can set it aside. So that's why it's so important for you to collaborate with other women-owned small businesses you know that do what you do and say, look, you know, why don't you submit for this as well? Yeah, and, you know, one of two things can happen. They do set it aside and both of you um, compete for it and only one of the two of you wins or, you know, maybe a third person. Or it could be something that maybe it's a bigger job than either one of you can do and you can collaborate and each of you gets a piece of it. But work with your fellow women-owned small businesses because that's the only certification where they have to be two or more qualified in order for, um, for it to be set aside. And that's for women-owned small business and economically disadvantaged women-owned small business. Okay? Any other questions? Oh, you're absorbing. Oh, we okay. can <laughs> You're grabbing the information. Like <laughs> okay, so, um, and I got off on a tangent. Where was I? <laughs> I do this a lot. Sorry, folks. Okay, so women-owned small businesses. So yeah, we were looking at the opportunities that are out there. So there are 74 current WOSB, uh, and this I didn't I didn't designate. So yes, ma'am. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you either need one or the other. I mean, but you, uh, how do I answer this? Okay, so woman-owned small business is one certification. EDWOSB is the second one. And the economically disadvantaged means exactly that. And we're going to be going into, into what that means here in just a bit. But um, with the economically disadvantaged, there are also different NAICS codes that are eligible under EDWOSB than those eligible under WOSB. I don't know why that is. That's the only certification that's a little crazy like that. But yeah, so if you do qualify for both, then you do want to get both. And it's super, I mean, this economically disadvantaged and woman-owned small business are the easiest two certifications in the world to get. So definitely do them both if you qualify for them. Okay. So, um, but yeah, you can go through here if you want to look at pre-solicitations and sources sought and the, just the solicitations, because this is um, also contracts that have been awarded. So we want to filter it and narrow the search a little more. So there are only 39 active opportunities <coughs> that are set aside for women and small business. And training system. Oh, that's me. I was like, what is that noise? <laughs> Library support services. Um, commercial aircraft financial service, airlift financial services. Okay. A lot of good stuff out here. Spider of the limb positioner. I wonder this. I was thinking that was something for trees. Apparently, that's a medical device. <laughs> yeah. So come out here and take a look at, at what's available and um and see. And you do know how to go in here and use the advanced search to to create search searches for your business, right? You all know that yet? 
Okay, I've got time. What? Yeah, I've got time. So <clears throat> here are you can use keywords and just type in different keywords um, that that are applicable to your business, like bikes, if that's something that you do, and then just search that way. And I don't know why exercise bike, gym equipment, all this other stuff comes up, or you can go in there and use your Nate's codes. So you put in your North American Industrial Classification System codes. You type them in here. You can type as many as you want um, in here. And then you can also search by PSC codes. Um, did we talk about that last week when we were doing SAM? I think we did. We talked about where to go to find your PSC codes and your, um, your FSC codes. And just as a reminder, Georgia Tech Procurement Assistance Center, so GTPAC. Under useful links at GTPAC, you can find your FSC and PSC code search. And then it's based on different services in your business. So if you are in training and education, these are the different, let's say you do training and curriculum development, educational services, and all that stuff, these are where you find those PSC codes. Okay? Georgia Tech Procurement Technical Assistance Center. So in Google, just type in GTPAC, GTPAC. Okay. Um, it's an FSC or a PSC code. PSC is product service code, FSC is federal supply code. <clears throat> and the FSC is only if you have commodities, if you sell commodities. If you're selling services, you're going to have a PSC code. But they're all four digits. The PSC codes start with letters. The FSC codes are all numbers. Okay. So these are where to find opportunities. And this is just one of several places. I know Abe has conducted classes about, um, you know, finding opportunities for your business, and we've got several of those in our training vault if you want to look through that. Um, but let's, you know, the gist of this class is about certification. So, oops, let's go back to uh, how do I make it so that it starts from where I want it to start from? Okay, so... Let's talk about um, how to qualify for these certifications. Many of them have an economic disadvantage component. So economic disadvantage is always going to look at these figures, um, your total income, your total assets, and net worth. Um, but the, 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 the amount may change depending on the certification that you're looking at. I was going to say, because this isn't very clear what I typed in here. Um, so if, for instance, you are considering 8A certification, that's going to be the least, least restrictive certification for economic disadvantage. So it asks that your total income is no more than uh, $250,000 averaged over the previous three years. It uh, looks at your total assets, that they're no more than $4 million, and that your total net worth is no more than $750,000. So those are the requirements for 8A certification. If you're looking at an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business, they look at your total income of no more than $350,000, total assets no more than $6 million, and your net worth no more than, wow. How did I forget the net worth figure? Still $750? Wow. I just totally went blank on that. I mean, I know these like the back of my hand. Goodness gracious. Okay. I, I'm sure it will at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> or I'm going to have to look it up. Um, for DOT certification, Department of Transportation, they have an economic disadvantage component. And the total income there is the same. Uh, the income, 350000 Total assets, they don't consider total assets, but they look at a net worth. The net worth is 1.375 million. 
is um, what the net worth has to be. And remember, your net worth is your total assets minus your total liabilities. So everything you own minus everything you owe is what your net worth is, uh, that remaining amount. Exactly. Yeah. They exclude the primary residence. They exclude the value of your business. And oftentimes they will exclude retirement assets that are not eligible for you until you turn 59 and a half. So if you, you know, did come out of corporate America and you've got a golden uh, nest egg from, you know, you retired as the president of Chase or something, and, <laughs> and you've got that, that, you know, six, $10 million nest egg, then that, they're not going to count that against you. Unless, of course, I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> so, the other thing, unless, you know, like some savvy person that took deferred compensation and only made $150,000. I'm like, really? Okay. So <laughs> these professional athletes, I was like, how did you get into this program, actually? <laughs> they, no, no. They, they, they look at adjusted gross income on the tax return, but they ask specifically for W-2s for you and your spouse. And that's a very good question for like the 8A certification, especially. They do ask for those personal financial statements for both you and your spouse. And, you know, a lot of people, and, you know, as a banker forever. So oftentimes spouses will give me this combined personal financial statement. I'm like, it's personal. They ask for your name and your social. So they don't want her assets on your personal financial statement and vice versa. So the same thing. So, you know, separate the retirement assets that you have. If you've got joint bank accounts, only half of it goes on yours, half on the other. If the home is owned by both of you, you split the value of it and put it on each of your returns and um, each of your financial statements and all of that. Right. They still... <laughs> They're still looking at the income of the disadvantaged individual, right? So that is why it's so important when you have, if you are working in a business with someone, that you make the designation of who owns the business. Yeah, everything is copacetic and we're all 50-50 and equal partners. But then in a situation like 8A, where I've already told you, it's a once-in-a-lifetime once in opportunity, one time only, nine years only, if the ownership is 50-50, that means each of you are having to blow your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get the company certified because no one of you owns 51% or more. Okay, so that's very important. And, and keep in mind, there are a lot of other factors, but there, there are ways that you can position an 8A with a majority and a minority owner and possibly extend time in the program by flipping it and making another person owner of a different company. But there are a lot of caveats and the FAR is very, they, they, they have it written very well so as to avoid that. But, you know, I'm smarter than your average bear. So I can check you out. It can be done within the rules because I'm not going to jail for nobody. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Okay. It depends um, on a couple of factors. Okay. Right. So, first of all, and y'all are in somewhere related, right? Yes. Yeah. Mother, son, okay. So there is the question that asks if anyone in your family has ever been an 8A participant. So you're going to have to answer that question, yes. It's also going to depend on what kind of company you have currently versus the company you had previously. Okay, perfect. Okay, so it, it probably will not be an issue at all. And then, But the one thing that you want to consider is that you probably don't need to have any sort of um, uh, what's or, you know, like professional title, like a president, vice president, executive title in his company to avoid any any presumption of affiliation whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, but in in this case, I imagine you work in the business and get a check and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just support, moral support. I love it. I love it. Yes. Yeah. But um, listed as an advisor, maybe. But th there are certain caveats, and it's all in the electronic code of federal regulations. And while we're here, let me go there. The ECFR. This is. Um, the Bible when it comes to anything related to certifications and all of that. ECFR.gov, yeah, Electronic Code of Federal Regulations. And Title 13 is the one that pertains to all of this 8A stuff. And the 8A Business Development Program. Eligibility requirements. Ownership must be direct. Dividends somewhere. Okay. And this is where it gets to ownership of another participant in the same or similar line of business. So that's one of the. the um, uh, oh, 124.105. And then um, ownership restrictions for non-disadvantaged individuals. Well, you're not a non-disadvantaged individual. You're just a former participant. It talks about it somewhere, but if, um, let me go back. This whole section relates to 8A. So uh, Title 13, uh, Part 124 is all about 8A. And it all has a provisions. And if you need translation, then I'm pretty good at translating most of it. There are a few areas that get a little squirrely that um, I have to check with my attorney. <laughs> like, does this mean what I think it means? There's just way too many double negatives in this. <laughs> so this is not, 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 not. <laughs> it's like, how many of those cancel each other out? And what is, it? is it a not or a yes? <laughs> okay. Is there a list cheat sheet available on the certifications with descriptions and qualifications? Um, yes, I do have a sheet that I can send you, Hassan. Um, give me your, your email address and I can get that over to you. It's not going to show the qualifications for each of them, but I'll, I'm gonna be getting into that. I'll be conducting, um, I think next week and maybe the week after. I've got two more of these. Um, workshops that I'll be doing around certification, so we're going to get into a whole lot of detail. So, um, yeah, so stick around and we'll get to more of that. But I, I'll send you what I have today that talks about um, the the different certifications, how they you know fit into the different sectors, corporate, uh, government, and municipal, and we'll send that out to you. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation and finish up with the social disadvantage part and excuse me, while I start at the beginning and do this whole thing again, because, you know, though it tells me I can start from where I left off, for some reason it never lets me get to that point. Okay, so social disadvantage. Uh, simply put, this is SBA's politically correct term for ethnicity and race. Okay, so you are presumed socially disadvantaged for purposes of any 8A certification if you are Black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian Pacific American, or subcontinent Asian American. Okay, so that means it's automatically presumed you don't have to do anything to prove your disadvantage. Um, what was I going to say? For purposes of DBE certification, so like a Department of Transportation Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, women are presumed socially disadvantaged as well. But that's not always the case. For none of the government, uh, the federal government certifications are women presumed disadvantaged. Women, however, can prove their disadvantage. So for purposes of 8A, if you will, these are the qualifications for 8A. 
but I have had several Caucasian females that have helped to successfully get into the 8A program because they were able to prove with what the SBA calls a preponderance of evidence that they have been discriminated against based on social disadvantage, whether it was in the educational system, the workforce, a number of different factors. So it, it, can, it, it can work. The other thing is that there are some criteria for disabled individuals as well. Um, I was working with someone with a disability, but because and got to learn a whole a lot about disabilities that I didn't know, because it wasn't um, an ADA qualified disability, um, or it was a newly qualified ADA disability, then you know, he decided to kind of just cut bait and not continue with the process um, just because he didn't want to have to jump through all the reins. And of course, some shifts happened in his business and economic disadvantage was proven to be challenging to try to prove. So he was like, now I got two hurdles to overcome. <laughs> so yeah, we just we cut bait on that. But um, so that's another factor. If you do um, have any kind of disability, then you can also, um, Prove your way into the program based on social disadvantage. So, uh, for DBE, disadvantage business enterprise, that is through the Department of Transportation. Yeah. So if you look, um, if you go to GDOT and look at the DBE application, then you can fill that out. And that's the one where the economic disadvantage criteria is a lot more, a um, lot more lenient because ADA is the most restrictive. Yeah. No, Department of Transportation. Yeah, the, the DOT, DBE, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm way early. What questions do we have? <laughs> Because this is, I mean, we broke it down into three separate classes, and maybe we should have only broken it down into two. But anyway, <laughs> what? Well, I, I, in some contexts, I have seen that. Keep in mind that there is a whole agency devoted to certifying women-owned small businesses. But I have found that there is a trend, and many of my clients too have it. So I've got you know several clients that are are both women and minority. So one of my clients in particular, a Native American female, so she has both her MBE certification through GMSDC and her her. Um, woman owned small business certification through WeBank. And depending on, like she's still doing business with the same companies with CSX, but depending on the year or what's in fashion or what's in vogue, either they wanna see, they promote the woman owned part or they, they don't care about the woman owned certification and they wanna see a minority owned. So um, there does seem to be a, um, a trend and it's probably just based on you know corporations every year they have to look at the numbers and look at what they're doing and look at what their shareholders are saying and and you know public outcry or whatever it may be about what's going on with their brand and then they they either push you know oh we need to do more business with veterans and that's a big thing i remember when i was working in banking as i was getting away from that around 2011 everyone was like you know all the commercials about we hire vets you know because everyone wanted to be on that bandwagon of supporting veterans. So it just depends on what the flavor of the month is, unfortunately. So that's one of the reasons why, because um, a lot of people ask me, well, I qualify for everything. Should I get them all? And I always tell them, maybe not, don't, don't go out and get them all because you think it's going to be a better benefit. Consider who your clients are. If your clients are corporate clients and you are both a woman and a minority, then 
maybe just get one of those two because MBE and WBE both speak to that same audience. So you've got to spend money at both GMSDC and WeBank. So, you know, if you're being penny wise, then just get one of the two because they both speak to that same audience. Um, so look at who your clients are and who you serve to determine which certification is, is right to get, you know. Um, and again, if your clients are municipal clients, don't bother doing the 8A and the hub zone just yet because, you know, the city of Atlanta doesn't know what a hub zone is. Uh, well, I mean, maybe they do, but most likely they don't. <laughs> So I was gonna say they have a whole bunch of them in their city, but you know it's not it's not their their purview. So right, it's not on their radar. They're concerned about you know they and, and they have a whole alphabet soup. So they they certify African American business enterprise, Asian Pacific American business enterprise, Hispanic American business enterprise. Um, I don't think they do Native American. So but. You know, they so get one of those certifications that they are concerned with and, and focus that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not to get into FedBizOps. You don't, I don't think you have to be in Sam to register for FedBizOps, do you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. To, I mean, to, and we had a same class. Last, was it last week? Oh wow. So yeah, we had the, the same class last week. Um, so this is kind of you know we're trying to progress in in natural order of of how to do things. So um, yeah, definitely get registered in Sam. But for your local certifications, your municipal certification. Your DOT certification, you don't have to be registered in SAM. For anything federal, you do. Because, um, you know, to get to the 8A application, to get to the woman-owned small business application, you have to have your DUNS number, your CAGE code, and your, your MPIN to even log in. So you have to have those to, to get into those systems. So if you weren't here last week, go online and listen to the recording. Unfortunately, and I think I saw what the error is, I think it was a user error on my part, <laughs> where I forgot to hit share my screen. So it's my melodious voice, but you can't follow along with the screenshot. So I hate that because, um, you know, we've done several of the SAM sessions online. I think that's how you actually did your SAM registration, right? Yeah. <laughs> listening to the recording but you know he had the advantage of seeing the screens as I was going through them um, but you know maybe it'll work because ideally I want you to have your own SAM registration screen up and I'm talking you through it all. Oh yeah no those days are gone. I know, I know. Everyone would, yeah. Not today. Yeah. Uh, right, right. Not government entities. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and very few states, I think North Carolina is the only state that I've ever dealt with that has a uniform certification where you kind of do one and it suffices for everyone. The good thing though, is that if you are going to be doing many of these and you know, next week we'll be talking about which certifications are right for you. Um, it, as long as you're organized and you go through the hard, arduous, painful work <laughs> of getting everything together for one, Put it in some kind of electronic folder somewhere and organize it and categorize it because all of the certifications ask for the same crap. I mean, so it's just they they may want to slice or dice a little differently. There may be one or two forms asked for here that weren't in the other place. But if you get it all together for one, then you're going to be pretty good getting it together for the rest of them. Yeah, there there are a few that you can't. So DeKalb County does have a restriction that you have to have been in business for one or two years. Okay, so they've changed it because at one point it was 
They wanted two years of business licenses. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Okay, gotcha. So, um, okay. You can't get it if you got two business licenses. Um, and like, <laughs> okay. Like, no, I mean, it sounds like they'll make an exception. Right, right. Okay. But for the most part, they're still going to go to secretary for the agency. You're filing date. And when you're filed, make sure you've been in business for one year. After that, after one year, you have to show them two different business licenses. Business license. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the cab county is one that has a time limit, but um, in A day, of course, you have to have been in business for two years for A day. But that's never the one that I tell you to start with. That's always the one that you finish with, simply because you know if you don't know how to win contracts, you're going to waste time in that. But like um, the MBEs and the WBEs, you can get those right away. You can start your business today and apply for those tomorrow. Um, what, what other ones? City. Uh -huh. um, I, I like that one. That, that one is one of my favorite certifications to do. They, and the great thing about the, um, the VA is they assign you, if you're going to do it yourself, they assign you to a representative that literally will call you and walk you through the whole thing. And if you forget stuff, they send you emails regularly and they'll even give you a call before they, they, um, swipe the whole thing from the system. So they, it's very responsive. That's one of, one of my favorite ones to do. Yeah. It, it is involved though, but it's, it's not anything you can't handle. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, stage of life, and it depends on how you wired. I mean, I, I didn't realize it, but I'm kind of one of those and over ten of attention to detail freaks, and you know, I'm looking at a document. I'm like, okay, the three periods missing. It's like they jump out at me and they turn colors. <laughs> um, the service disabled vet and veteran owned small business. Yeah. So, um, but that one, that one is kind of awesome. And I, so I, I don't mind doing these. And but if you're one of those people where you abhor paperwork, and you know, you easily get frustrated with systems that are finicky, then this might be hard for you. But that's why, you know, we've got all kinds of different scenarios where we have the classes that walk you through it and maybe we can spend a Saturday together and you can get through it. <laughs> or, you know, we've got the total done for you services where you're like, okay, here, how much do I write you a check for? And you do this one. And then I give you a checklist that you give to a personal assistant. <laughs> Because you don't want to find the stuff on the checklist. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions, folks? We got like 20 minutes, so we're early. This is crazy. This never happens. Any questions online? I know we had, um, oh, we got up to six attendees now. I, how do I get to my questions? Uh, okay. All right. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It might have been. Oh, no. I don't know how to. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I answered all of these. Great. Okie dokie, folks. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Who raised the hand? Yeah. Charlene, you've got a question? I just unmuted you so you can talk to me. Hello, how are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. Good. Sorry, I'm I'm just getting on. I had an emergency and just getting on like right at the end, but I was just like, whatever I could get today, that's what I could get. But I, okay. I had a question just um at the end when you were talking about the first ones you recommend. I think you said like M E W B E. Could you go back to those again so I can make sure I have that 
So as far as which ones do I recommend you do first or what? Yes, I think that's what you were saying, the ones you would recommend uh -huh. to do first. And I did get the PA. Then you said W B E A I think N P mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it, what you do first, uh, Charlene, is going to depend on your business because it depends on who your clients are. If you are serving commercial clients like Coca-Cola's and IBM's and all that, thanks so much for coming again. I'll see you. Um, then you you definitely want to get like your MBE certification or your WBE certification. But if you are working with um with federal clients, then you want to look at your SBA tax certifications, so your eight A's and hub zones. And then, if you're working with city, states, and municipalities, whoops, then um, you need to do uh, certifications like um, like your city of Atlanta, the Cab County, etc. Okay. One okay. quick thing, because I've got folks here leaving, so let me okay. make a quick announcement. Um, okay. We do have a small business connection series event that is coming up on February 21st. So um, for those of you that may have been here for our last one, when we have the CDC and other agencies present, you definitely want to be here for this. We're going to be talking about building your dream team because it's going to take more than just you and your business to make it successful. So this talks about all the professional, um, all the service providers that you need to have in your business, whether or not you hire them in house or you work, uh, to partner with them. We can connect you with those folks. So um, we do have an Olympian, um, a gold medalist that's going to be speaking about, you know, of course, building a dream team around her because you don't get to gold in the Olympics without having a team. Um, and then tying that into government contracting with a panel of professionals like your insurance agents, friends, benefit professionals, HR people that you're going to need, accountants, that's so important. Um, people that understand the FAR and all that good stuff. So definitely join us for February 21st. Go ahead and get signed up. Early bird registration is until Pamela went away. I think it's February 15th. I know. You just early bird registration is until until Friday. Oh, until February 1st. See, I was giving it away until the 15th. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I, know. I was going to say, the Pam just always keeps me straight. So um, register until February 1st, and it's only $15 to get in. Um, all the other ones that we've done like this have been $50, so it's definitely a steal of a deal. Go ahead and get uh, registered for that now um, and um, get your seat, because usually we get about 80 to 120 people um, packed in here. So get your seat, get your space, and join us on February 21st. Okay, so um, y'all are dismissed. Charlene, if you still have questions, I can finish answering those for you. <laughs> okay, I think I'm good. The last thing you said was the city of Atlanta, city of the cow. Yeah, city of Atlanta, the cab county. And mm -hmm. um, the cab county, you can you have to be in business for at least a year before you can do the cab county. But um, the ones you can do right away would be WBE or MBE. You can start your business today and get certified with those either of those agencies tomorrow. Either of those organizations. Okay, those were the ones I was trying to get. You said WBE and MBE. Right. Women Business okay. Enterprise and Minority Business Enterprise. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. Well, I was trying to get to it. Thank you so much. I hey, I missed it, but I'll catch back up later. But thank you so much and have a good day. You too. Have a okay. good one. Bye. Right. Bye, bye. Okay. Thanks, you guys, for joining. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Reggie. And uh, we will see you next week. Take care.